Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, so I have here with me today uh, John Scott Railton from the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto and Julia Wono from, uh, from Internet Without Borders or in Internet Sans Frontières. <laughs> and we're going to talk about disinformation today. So I want to talk a little bit about setting out the problem, uh, because we hear a lot about disinformation in the United States. We think about the 2016 election, but I think there are a lot of stories that are happening internationally that I think we, we also need to talk about as we think about disinformation. So I'm going to turn it over to you to, to give us some examples of what you're seeing uh, around the world apart from the United States. Yeah, well, I'll go ahead. Thanks, John. Thank you, Alyssa, and thanks, Cloudflare, for the invitation. Um, to s discuss this very important, important issue. So, um, Internet Without Borders has been uh, monitoring a bit the cyber development uh, in the world, and specifically in what we call emerging markets, and more specifically, um, Africa. And uh, I must say that when we talk about disinformation, uh, we have to remember that there are different forms of disinformation campaigns. We usually think, indeed, of the 2016-like disinformation campaign, which have been state-sponsored by a foreign state. But we tend to forget in the conversation the, the campaigns that are sponsored locally, nationally, by a government, uh, which hires a foreign company, for instance, to, uh, to push certain messages, to push certain, um, certain yeah, information which, is not, which, which are not necessarily grounded on facts about the country. I'll give a very specific example, which is quite old, but uh, which uh, will make sense uh, with the rest of the conversation that we'll have. I remember in 2011, we worked a lot on a country located in Central Africa and called Gabon, where there was a, an, uh, an uprising at, at the time. And um, uh, at the time, nobody was talking about boats, but already that government was hiring uh, I think it was a European or Israeli company, I can't remember quite well, but it was a private sector company which was selling certain products to influence the, the, the opinion and influence um, the, the, the image that we, have, what, that we may have of certain countries or of certain information uh, on social media. And the, the social media platform that was used at the time was Twitter. Uh, there were tons of messages uh, spread on, the, on a hashtag which was supposed to catalyze messages from civil society on the ground on what was happening, and they were all um, flooded with messages from boats coming from people tweeting from India, for instance, or from, from the Philippines, who, who had nothing to do with Gabon, but who were tweeting a lot and flooding the hashtag with false messages. So uh, this, this is one of the campaigns that comes to my mind, but we also forget in the conversation the campaigns which are uh, not necessarily opposing governments, but which are which happen in a very tense political context, for, for instance, a civil, a civil war, which opposes two, I mean, two polarized communities, and in which uh, the, the disinformation campaign, campaign will come on top of other very uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous kind of speech, like hate speech, for instance, and will well, trigger afterwards very horrible uh, consequences in the real world. So uh, these are some, some of the, 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 the ideas that came up to my mind when we first discussed the, the issue. I don't know if you... Um. Oh, I think Julie's right. Um, so I'm John. The Citizen Lab mostly works on targeted attacks against civil society groups. But here's the thing. In almost every case where we've scratched, we've also come across a disinformation element. And sometimes these are like hybrid phishing campaigns or malware campaigns that end up uh, in disinformation. But to give some kind of like evidentiary perspective here, the folks at the Oxford Internet Institute have been tracking misinformation and disinformation online. And in 2017, they reported that 48 countries um, showed some evidence of systematic, organized disinformation. 30 of those cases were around elections. And just to put a big highlighter on Julie's point, most of that is domestic facing. I think when we seek to think about disinformation, I'm an American, although I work at a Canadian place, I think about 2016, we all do. And the narrative there is something foreign came in and messed with our stuff. I think, though, that often leads to wanting to seek authority, like the government, to help us regulate it. 
The problem is what happens when the government is the entity doing the disinformation. And by volume, I think the work from the Oxford Internet Institute will tell you, and anecdotally I can confirm this, by volume it's governments doing it themselves, mm -hmm. often around elections. Mm -hmm. So is it that when we saw the 2016 campaign, the reason it got so much press, even though it had been happening around the world for so long, was that it was happening in the United States uh, and people weren't expecting it to happen here? Is, is that, I mean, it seems like it's much more, you know, we have, we, we talk about disinformation, we talk about fake news. <laughs> we're, we're, we're now talking about it in the United States, but it sounds like this has been a systematic problem in other places. Uh, and maybe we're not actually in that new of a place in some ways. We're just, the United States is just catching up to everyone else. Yeah, uh, this is in a, a bad way, I should add. Yeah, no, this is a very important. What, what we think um, at Internet Without Borders is it's that we are operating on a global platform which is accessible virtually everywhere by everyone. Uh, so it's important, even when you're in the Silicon Valley developing a product, it's important to pay attention to signals that come from 10,000 kilometers from where you are, because that's, no, that's usually 90% of the time when, where certain practices are being tested first because mm -hmm. the connected population is so small and it's possible to test products and to, yeah. text, to test the reaction to those products before, well, getting them back home. And the, the fake news uh, debate in the US election is exactly that. We've learned afterwards that there had been tests in, uh, by Cambridge Analytica, for instance, um, in, uh, in countries elsewhere which had nothing to do with the American or the British context. But two, two three years later, they were taken back home, basically, by certain companies and, mm -hmm. and used by certain governments. So it's, it's important to, yes, it's shocking when it happens in the United States because, well, everybody would imagine that institutions are strong and everything is set to avoid this type of things from happening. But no, nobody um, is, um, I mean, is protected against this. It's, uh, it's, it's a global threat and it should be perceived that way. And in that sense, it's important to pay attention to signals even if they are located 10,000 kilometers from home. So global threat, uh, we're now trying to figure out how we address it. I mean, what's at stake as we figure out what those solutions are, as we think about it, as we think about what we're trying to do? So here's the thing that makes me nervous. I'm nervous about disinformation, and I'm, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like everyone else is a, a more likely to be subjected to disinformation than you, right? Like, I know, I'm, I'm canny. But um, <laughs> what, what scares me is actually the first response to this. So you've got a disruptive set of technologies. Some of it's new, right? Like the scale of bots, probably new. Micro-targeting, probably new on a historical time frame, right? There are other things like that that feel new. Different kinds of anonymity, new. But in my book, disinformation is about selling ideas. So I cut it like this. There's a kind of disinformation that's about gumming up the conversation, a lot of automated stuff that makes it hard for voices to come out. So there's that. And that, to me, feels like a much more understandable problem. It's like a spammy problem. But then there's another half of it, uh, which I like to look at like this. So disinformation is marketing. The product is feelings. And the profit is behavior. <laughs> Ultimately, we're working in an environment where much of our behavior is happening on big, essentially marketing platforms. Platforms designed to deliver behavior to advertisers to buy product. And my big concern is that uh, as long as we're sort of inhabiting those platforms, the imagination of people who are going to want to manipulate us through those platforms is always going to be moving faster than the companies that are providing those platforms. So that raises all sorts of difficult questions about how we deal with this, right? It seems like... Uh, the, the questions of what constitutes disinformation, for example, uh, mm -hmm. get very murky when you get into marketing. Um, when you start talking about what are you trying to do, what are you trying to accomplish? So as you think about solutions, as you think about things that we can do, what, what are they? I mean, how do, you, how do you get ahead of something that's essentially a marketing campaign designed to, to, to play on your feelings? Well, it, it, it is... Uh, it is new, probably, in the, in, in the, in the extent of... Uh, of 
well, the dissemination, the possibilities of dissemination. But, I mean, propaganda is not something new. We're human beings, and we've been here, we've been the same for pretty, pretty quite a long, a long time. So, um, um, it's, what we think is that it's, it's very important to be, as I was saying, to pay attention to certain signals, to, to remember that history repeat, repeats itself, unfortunately, and that there are certain, uh, well, when there is innovation, there are obviously risks, and that we need to be aware of this and not think only about you know, how disruptive we are and, and reacting whenever there is a problem. No, reacting costs more, uh, it, makes, uh, it makes us waste a lot of time. Uh, instead, it's important to, to be proactive, to understand that, well, the threats, there are threats, and, and that human beings, when faced with new, uh, with innovation, they tend to react quite, I mean, historically, almost the same way. So uh, um, being proactive is quite an interesting, I mean, I think when I say being proactive, I'm talking here to uh, uh, produ product makers who are located here, and for instance, in the Silicon Valley. This morning, somebody was saying that in the Silicon Valley, people live in a bubble. Uh, it's probably time to like, break the bubble and uh, understand that the, global the globality of, um, of the tools and, um, and the effects they can have, and uh, yes, anticipating a bit more, uh, why not conduct human rights impact assessments, for instance, we're talking about that in the environment sector, it would be important to talk about that in the tech sector as well. Whenever you're about to launch a product, or whenever you, you well, think about the impact that this can have from a human rights perspective, from a human perspective, a social perspective, these are some of the, the ideas that are like flowing in, our, in, in conversations. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, the, the challenge there, it seems to me, is that when you start talking about human rights assessments on, or impact assessments on, on products, uh, particularly information products, there, the benefits of the information products are, are also tangible. So you, you end up in a world where how do you assess the, the negative impacts um, while also weighing it against the potential positive impacts of, of dissemination of information, which can be an incredibly powerful tool. So, you know, the Internet as a, as a tool is, is, is an important piece of what we're seeing. It is, and it, it's now a, a reality. Um, talking about solutions for a second, um, I think there's been a big push in the US to have a conversation about fake news. And to me, this is a, a dangerous oversimplification of the problem set. The idea that the real problem is that people are saying false things. There are a lot of wrong yeah. things being said. And what we need is to somehow telegraph to people that there are credibility problems with the sources of that, and that maybe the things are, are fake. Uh, to me, this is like the easiest possible solutionism, and it's not going to work. Disinformation is about marketing. And if you want to understand the future of disinformation, you understand the future of advertising, right? Mm -hmm. What that means is that disinformation, as it existed in the US in 2016, is not what it looks like today, and it's mm -hmm. not what it looked like last year. What talking about trying to block the proliferation of false stories does, in my mind, is it brings back a sort of a scary cudgel for the regulation of speech, and that's the idea of defamation. So here's a, company that, a country that had an issue with um, disinformation. Cambodia um, has a disinformation law. It's new. In 2007, they got rid of their defamation law. Uh, under pressure from the opposition. And the reason they got rid of it is because it was a cudgel being used by the state to try to limit people who are investigating corruption. It's back now, and of course the first use was <laughs> against a person investigating corruption. So my concern is that states are moving very quickly to talk about trying to block the state of fake news. Over 30 governments have some kind of a regulatory thing in play, mm -hmm. or a law that they're working to pass or have already passed about fake news. But to me, this is like ultimately extremely dangerous. And when we talk about that with respect to technology too, we have risk. So more and more of what is called disinformation now is happening in darker places, like on secure uh, chat platforms. Mm -hmm. And my concern, if, our con if, if, if the stated concern is about blocking the proliferation of fake stories, we're going to erode encryption. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to erode, uh, erode a lot of flexibility um, that users have right now. And probably do it in a way that's fighting a war that, that's already old. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah. and on, on the, this very important remark is 
uh, there is another another step that we're that more and more governments are are taking, which is to censor the the access to internet itself uh, for, on the on the basis of the well, just justifying it by the fact that well, disinformation is causing havoc to the, in the country and uh, and and is harming uh, national security. So. Yes, the, the stakes are higher. It's really about connectivity being at, at stake here, and specifically connectivity in, in zones where uh, we are saying that people are yet to be connected, and uh, uh, it's, it's quite frightening. And on, the, on, on what you just said on you know, um, regulating speech itself, it's not only in you know, more or less repressive countries. Even in democracies, this is, I mean, there is a debate on that. I'm thinking specifically, uh, I, I live in France, and some of you may have followed this summer, there was a big scandal because one of the bodyguards of the, of the president was accused of uh, molesting protesters. And um, uh, there was a study that was published which alleged that, that it was initially a campaign that was, um, that was put out in the French public debate by state foreign states uh, or actors sponsored by foreign government and specifically the Russian government. So, uh, but the thing is here, uh, it, it was a way to, in, to uh, in, well, introduce the idea that it may have, although the story was true, but the way it was put out may have been used to destabilize the government and the institution, whereas no, it was actually uh, a, a very important public debate which triggered uh, a, an investigation, national investigation, and which is, I mean, which makes the, the, the democracy and the French democracy healthier. So yes, on that idea that, well, regulating speech can have even democracies uh, doing what you know, repressive countries uh, uh, we're, we're more familiar with, and um, that censorship. So, so how do we break it down then? So you have, a, you have foreign interference uh, that comes in, in, in pretty robust ways and disinformation, which you kind of want people to know about, right? Um, you have the potential for the government itself to try to get involved, to, to manipulate pub public opinion, uh, which you also probably want your people to know about. Um, and then you just have sort of the things on the margins, they're, they're generating unrest. Um, you know, you're, you're riling up different groups for whatever, your, whatever purposes you might have. Are they the same? Do you deal with them the same way? Uh, I mean, how do, we, how do we think about solutions? Well, so one <laughs> no, no hard, no hard question. questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think one, one place where we're at right now is we're very, very early, right? We've connected much faster than we could secure and we've connected a lot faster than our norms and social institutions even know sort of how to regulate behavior. And because a lot of these are actually old problems in new digital clothing, we've made a big mistake, which is we've forgotten how to talk about like sociology and stuff like that, and how this actually influences the relationships that people have to uh, technology. Um, every time I think about this, the first thought that comes to my mind is like, oh wow, media literacy, man, if we could just <laughs> teach people uh, how to do media literacy. Um, but then uh, I stop myself and it's like, well, there, there are a couple problems with this. First of all, We've media been literacy. We've for 100 years. Yeah, but also like media literacy is what you teach to other people who you think don't get it because you think that you actually know what's really going on, right? It's like, how do we get those people to that? Um, but I'll highlight something interesting that was inspired by reading something by uh, Dana Boyd, who's a, a lucid critic of um, society, which is, uh, you know who was marketing the slogan of questioning the media? Russia Today. For a long time, Russia Today's um, tagline was like, question everything, right? <laughs> um, uh, and I, I mean, I think that the challenge is, you know, if we start talking too much about let's educate individuals, mm -hmm. individuals and their sort of thinking should be like the last, uh, you know, the, the line of last <laughs> resort um, in a way. And we know from security then when we talk about trying to teach people better security behaviors, right, like it doesn't really work, right? Like <laughs> these are public health yeah. scale problems and they have to be addressed that way. I don't know, I don't know if Julie also has a thought, got lots more, but. Um, I, I kind of disagree a bit with you. Um, for the first time, that's the first time we disagree with something. Um, <laughs> We're good with hopefully that. Hopefully not <laughs> the last, yeah. <laughs> no, hopefully not the last, of course, but, um, um, Again, we, we have to, to think that th there, there are countries, parts of the world where 
up until very recently, the only source of information was a national state media which spread propaganda. <laughs> back to, we were back okay. at it. Um, and that suddenly they're faced with, you know, they're flooded with information. Some of them are flooded with information located only on one platform. That's another debate. But nevertheless, the sources are, come from almost everywhere in the world. Um, also, um, you have to think that this same, um, well, citizens also suddenly, I mean, we, we, are, we, we, are, we were most here were born with the internet, basically, and evolved with it. And I mean, but imagine you're, you're I don't know, a farmer in remote, uh, I don't know where, somewhere in a, in a developing country, and, and uh, you're suddenly faced with a tool that allows you to speak to anyone in, I mean, it's, it's, it's we have to be, to, to, to put ourselves in, in the place of this individual. So um, not saying that, we know better. I don't think it's the, the issue is necessarily that has to be seen that way, but uh, it's rather that um, it's, it's, it's also a challenge to receive information in the 21st century. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, probably education is not the right word, but uh, because obviously we can all educate each other on, on receiving information, you rightly said, but um, um, at least... Um, I don't know, having more conversation on the media themselves, like, uh, like uh, there are conversations in democracies about the fourth power every, um, yeah. I mean, usually, very often. It should be probably the same in, 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 uh, in other parts of the world. And I think that's, that's the, the strength, sorry, of, uh, and probably the utopia of the internet initially is, was to uh, enable uh, individuals uh, to have access to information and be able to, well, make the most of the information that they receive. So, uh, um, yeah, that's probably not the, the, the answer, the perfect answer, but I'm just saying that, yeah, it's, it's well, it's, it's a global problem, so there shouldn't be, like, you know, only one solution, so obviously. I think Julie's <laughs> right, actually. Um, <laughs> and to me, like, you know, this, 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 this thing that I said earlier, right, disinformation is the marketing, um, the product is the feeling, the profit is um, behavior. Sounded fun in the shower the other day. But like, um, if you think about it, not all disinformation campaigns work. A lot of them don't. In my work, I come across crummy disinformation ops all the time, a lot of them from nation states, and most of them fall flat. And part of the reason is that, you know, if you're thinking about this in the context of a product language, like often the market research is really bad and stilted. Mm -hmm. And an authoritarian's like, you know, comic book conception of how people might think, especially in a foreign country, mm -hmm. uh, is not going to work. Um, that said, the other part of this is that if you're selling a product, you're selling it to a market that's interested. And a lot of the stuff that was sold in 2016 was selling product where there was a market appeal. Racism, class differences, this sort of stuff um, pre-existed uh, you know, not only recent Russia, but also the Soviet Union in the US, right? These were bigger problems. And so to me, I feel like the solutions are at societal scale. A lot of them look like they're gonna have to come through education mm. uh, and how people are taught. Where they're not gonna come from, though, is the next couple years. Um, I think it's sort of a fact of the matter that uh, there will be elements of addressing disinformation, some of them that look technical, some of them that look societal, um, but there's no reason to expect that this is a solvable problem. In part, remember we were talking about elections at the beginning of this, right? There are going to be elections every couple years, right? And if you look in a lot of the countries where people are rolling disinformation campaigns, who's running it? Who's paying for it? Well, typically it's political parties. Who are they paying? They're paying political consultants and they're paying marketing firms, right? These are not like mysterious disinformation operators. What we're actually talking about is the manipulation and shaping of human opinion. Right now, I think a lot of people in the US and North America are exercised about it because it feels foreign and scary. But in fact, like the story about the manipulation of public opinion to achieve ends, it's always been happening. It was happening when we were teenagers and when we were kids. Um, a thought on that. Uh, how many people have been to a casino? Show of hands. Oh, come on. Everybody's been to a casino, right? <laughs> so what's the job of the casino operator? To keep you in the casino, right? Like cheap food, you know, <laughs> do whatever you want. Just don't walk out the door, right? Like, where is the door? 
Um, social media is exactly <laughs> the same way, right? The objective of a large company is to get you into the casino and keep you there. And there's a fun fact about addictive and compulsive behavior, which is it loses its hedonics pretty quickly. People are actually not happy for the most part when they're dealing with a behavioral addiction, but they stick around. Mm. And I would say diagnostically, everything we know about the behavior of people on social networks is they're not happy when they spend a lot of time there, but they stick around, right? <laughs> and if you think about who's really got a good bit of market research and a good take on human psyche, it's the platform level. It's not at the individual marketing firm selling stuff level. And those platforms have much more subtle ways of shaping behavior that are much less available to researchers like me or Julie or others to identify. And yet we know that those feelings and sentiments can shape things like electoral behavior. So my fear is not disinformation, just as we've seen it in the past couple of years, but like the subtle manipulation of affect around election times, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could easily price out some marginal voters by making people slightly less happy on election day, right? This to me is much scarier because the scale is better um, than any sort of like, you know, specific sale of a, of a bad fact. So I was going to try to end my comments on a positive note. I don't think that was it, for the record, but I'm still going to take questions. So, so I'm, I want to turn to the audience. Oh, here, why don't we? Um, yes, so uh, I'd like you to talk, if you may, um, about uh, the uh, upcoming social credit system in China and the risk of that being spread around the uh, world to totalitarian regimes. Julie? <sighs> Again, I was going to end on a positive <laughs> note. I'm just going to point that out. No, there is hope. There is hope. Um, yes, um, that's a very, very important question. Um, so China, as you know, uh, is rolling out, uh, you know, aggressive politics of relationship, of diplomatic, economic, financial relationship with certain countries in the world and a specific continent, which is, uh, which is Africa. And uh, what we have been uh, really worried about is what comes with that cooperation. We know that China is very proud of, I mean, is, is saying to be proud of, having been able to build an internet which is controlled, but nevertheless allows big companies to make a lot of money, thinking of or certain, some of them. We've talked about some of them this morning. Um, so obviously, it, it starts, I mean, the, the idea is, starts, start, is starting to flow into the discussions between uh, the Chinese government and its counterparts at, and partners in, in Africa. We've recently heard of, for instance, uh, we, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence and China being, of course, uh, one of the, I mean, leading countries uh, researching on, on this specific uh, issue. And we, we've learned that um, uh, to, to counter the issue of, you know, diversity and, you know, bias in the artificial intelligence, what certain Chinese companies are, are doing is that they're going to African countries to get data sets on populations which are uh, more I mean, diverse compared to China and, and Europe. And uh, well, in, in, on a continent where there is no privacy law, where there is no, uh, well, almost no regulation when it comes to internet issues, it's, it's very easy to imagine that, well, it's possible to build such social credit or whatever civilian state in the, in the, in the like of what's happening in certain parts of China today. So uh, it's, a, it's a source of worry, and that's why it's even more urgent for, for you know, companies um, in the US or in Europe, which are, which are selling products to these countries, to make sh I mean, to, to talk about this, well, to, to anticipate on the threats and anticipate on the issues, because uh, basically we are at a, at a crossroads where certain countries which are yet to be connected are facing a choice. Either they're choosing open and free internet in the, in the way that we've uh, known it in the US or in the Europe, or they're choosing a profitable internet which they can control. And you can imagine for a repressive country which choice they're going to make. So yeah, it's a, it's a crossroad. Uh, so we're going to take one more question. We're going to try to make it, keep it super quick. How would you Sorry. rate the effectiveness right now of you know, the platforms like Google and Facebook and trying to counter fake news? I think a lot of what they do, they set up like a little widget. And here's like 15 New York Times articles to read like when there's 
you know, something that's a little bit controversial. And it seems that, as you were saying, that a lot of this disinformation is spreading to sort of the secure messaging platforms. Like, that's going to pose an even bigger technical challenge for a lot of these companies to sort of counter that. At that point, you're just, like, passing notes. Yeah, so real quick, um, I think that uh, it's probably not going to change much for users to see nags and behavioral nags. In the same way that cigarette advertising has a really awesome Technicolor ad and then a little black and white warning at the bottom in text, right? Um, I'll just sort of uh, share this thought, which is a lot of our conversation right now is shaped around the issue of platforms, right? Oh, man, would platforms help? Well, we're sitting here at Cloudflare, thanks for having us, which is supporting a lot of independent websites, right? that are not living on platforms, and it still represents some speech that doesn't fit um, that mold of like what the platform approves and how it curates it for you. So that's awesome. Um, and uh, thank you folks here for doing that work. <laughs> thank you, for, uh, and that end. See, that's the positive end, right there. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>